name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. Thank you for the commitment of your people. And thank you for their faithfulness. I pray, Lord, you reward everyone abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. I will pray, Lord, that your people will not be weary. Amen. We will not be tired. Amen. You will give the fire and put the fire in every soul in Jesus' name. Amen. I will pray that this work will prosper in our hands. And as you are blessing the work, you are blessing the workers. So that all the needs of our lives you meet and supply in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding tonight to behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Strengthen us, everyone without exception. Touch us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Once again, we welcome you to the workers meeting of today i'm so happy that you are here not only happy i'm impressed uh, because of the obedience and the faithfulness of all our workers you had probably a short notice that we'll still be having workers meeting today and here you are and here we are and the blessings of the lord will be upon everyone in jesus name as you know, I've been going through the workers' meeting in line with uh, the passages we use uh, for our uh, building the body. And the reason I do this, let me show you in um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As workmen, as workers, we need to understand the passage you are teaching. And we need to understand the context of the passage we are looking at so that we will not mislead the people and so that we will not work in a way that God will not bless. And so we look at the passage again. We look at the passage in line with the understanding of the whole passage for the preacher, for the pastor, for the leader, and for the workers. It so happens that today we are looking at a prayer. We're looking at intercession in Genesis chapter 18. Before then, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm reading here from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. What, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. I want you to notice that part. I will pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with understanding also. And so as we look at the passage today, we're coming to Genesis chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18, we're looking at it from verse 20. Genesis chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 20. And I want you to notice uh, all that the Lord is teaching us here. Because of this intercessory prayer of Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. I come to Genesis 18 verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of each which is which is come unto me and if not i will know and the men turned their faces from thence and went toward sodom and abram stood yet before the lord before we go on you see here god wanted to do something but he must inform abraham he wanted to investigate, wanted to examine the situation in Sodom and Gomorrah. He is God. He is almighty. He is independent. He can do whatever he wants to do anytime without telling you, without telling me. And yet, because Abraham maintained a relationship, a covenant relationship with the God, with the God of heaven, and God claimed him to be a friend. He said, I cannot do anything. It doesn't really concern Abraham directly. 
it concerns Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, we know that Lot, the nephew, was there, but God shouldn't uh, have felt I must tell him. But he said, I will tell him. Can you maintain a relationship with God that God will say, I'm doing this in this city? And I will tell you before I do it. I'm doing this in your family. That one uh, comes closer home. That he says, I, I see the condition of your extended family. You know, your cousin, your nephew, and all the people, and where your people are. But I am going to inform you. And when God informs you about anything, uh, do you wait and say, well, God must have a purpose of talking about uh, to me about that. We'll talk about it together. I will talk to God about it. That's why we're learning all this. Number one, he wasn't in the dark. He wasn't ignorant. God said, this is what I'm going to do. And look at it now in verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous or the wicked? What a great question. Will you destroy the righteous or the wicked? We need to understand as we pray, especially in our country here, not only in our country, in our continent of Africa, not only in our continent of Africa, even beyond Africa, because it appears that wrong notions and wrong ideas about a curse, about yoke, about oppression, about attack, about affliction, we have wrong notion. It's like uh, we think that whatever is happening to the unbeliever must be happening to the believer. We're thinking that if there's a curse upon an extended family because we're members of that family that must happen to us as well we're not thinking of the fact that we're children of God we're not thinking of the fact that we're righteous we're not thinking of the fact that God has a principle he will not destroy the righteous or the wicked all these people are going about and they are talking about curses they're talking about uh, ancestral spirit and curses and they're talking about territorial curses they're talking about yokes and oppressions and they make the believers to understand that because of where you come from and because of our background this will happen to you this will happen to you except you go for a special deliverance we don't find that in the bible it's all the imagination of people and it's because of their background look at verse 23 again and abram drew near and said will thou also destroy the righteous of the wicked peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein that be far from thee to do after this manner even abram understood without going through all the the theological um, rigmaroles of the people that are telling us today that if there is you came from uh, this background you came from this background there must be a cause of yoke abraham said god you can't do this you can't allow the same oppression the same affliction upon the righteous that comes upon the unbelievers uh, he asked a question and before god asked the question he himself answered he said i know you i know your nature i know your principles i know your pattern that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous or the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right he will do right I said they will do right. Let's look at the answer of the Lord. And the Lord said, wonderful. If I find in Sodom, you remember Sodom? Sodom of all places. The most wicked, exceedingly sinful at that time. And God said, if I find in Sodom, terrible Sodom, sinful Sodom, wicked Sodom, occultic Sodom, immoral Sodom, defiled Sodom. It says, if I find in Sodom 50 within the city, then I will spare all the place, tell me the rest, for their sakes. All the place for their sakes. Now when you read the Bible, you need to think through. Ask yourself, how many people would you find in Sodom? Because it's a city. And then Gomorrah, because that's a city too. And all the environment, because, uh, you know, it said about the villages all around Sodom. 
uh, let's go on we'll make the calculations later and then it goes on to say in uh, verse uh, verse 27 and abram answered and said behold now i have taken upon me to speak unto the lord which am but dust and ashes hold on there wasn't any promise for Abraham to claim. Abraham was just acting on the very fact of the principle of righteousness, justice, fairness, and equity. And he's saying, I, I don't think you'll do this. I don't think you're going to destroy the righteous or the wicked. There wasn't any definite particular promise that was standing on except the nature of God Almighty. Look at this in verse 28, Power Adventure. The ancient lack five of the 50. They we will thou destroy the city for the lack of five. And he said, If I find forty and five, I will not destroy it. And you say, Abraham had not heard any message about importunity in prayer. Abraham had not heard anything about praying and praying and praying and saying, I will not be denied. He just knew this, making requests before the Lord. And when you don't know any promise, you look at the nature of God and you look at the possibilities in the prayer and then you say, how about this? And then you go on and you're asking the Lord and he spake unto him yet again and said, peradventure, there shall forty be found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, oh, let not the Lord be angry. Why did he say that? Because actually the two angels had gone to Sodom and now God was being delayed from going back to heaven. And yet God will accept that delay. Think about that. Christ had not come. And he maintained this uh, fellowship and uh, friendship with the almighty God. He said, I know I'm delaying you. The God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth. And was speaking face to face with the almighty God. And he said, please don't be angry about this. And I will speak for adventure. There shall such be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find such there. And everyone was thinking about the condition of Sodom. He was thinking about how defiled, how dead, how terrible Sodom was. And so he continued and he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. He knew he was speaking to the Lord. He knew he wasn't speaking to an angel. The angels had gone to Sodom. But now he was speaking to the Lord directly. He knew it was God. When you pray, are you conscious of who you are speaking to? When you pray, are you thinking, I'm speaking to the Almighty God? And the things I say, according to his word, he must keep his word. He knew he was talking to the Lord, and he said, Paradventure, there be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Think about this. Coming from fifty and coming to twenty. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Paradventure 10 shall be found there. Tell me the rest. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Look up for a moment. How many people do you think might be living in Sodom? If we, take, if we say 10,000, I mean Sodom, Gomorrah and all the other places, I don't think that's a large number. Because as you think about Nineveh, we're talking about 120,000 for Nineveh. Let's even bring it down and say perhaps you have just 1,000, which is a very small number, in uh, Sodom. And God said, if I find 10 righteous people in Sodom, because of these 10 people, the 1,000 people there, I'll spare them. Divide 10,000 by 10. What do you have? Tell me. 100. That means one ratio 1 to 100. If I find one righteous person among 100 unrighteous people, because of that one person, I'll spare the 100 people. I will wait for them to change. I will not destroy them immediately. Think about your family. How many people do you remember your family? Up to five, up to ten, 
up to 20 up to 25 can you if i told you now all your family your father your mother your siblings brothers sisters cousin nephew everybody begin to write down names maybe by the time you write 50 you would have tried even if you wrote 100 and you are the only one righteous among them and we're not talking about the righteousness of the old testament we're talking about the righteousness of the new covenant that christ has made you righteous and christ has uh, washed you with his blood and then he imparts unto imputes unto you his own righteousness and he gives you his grace and you're living in practical positive profitable righteousness before the lord and you're only one among ten in your family one among hundred in your family god says if i see one out of a hundred ten out of a thousand he says i'll spare the city i'll give them chance i'll wait i'll not destroy them immediately you see the preaching we're having and you see all the things people are telling us they turn it around they say that if you are righteous and your family is up to about 10. They say because of the unrighteousness of those 10 people, God is going to put in a curse and terrible things on them. Not only that, even yourself that says, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, they say you will suffer, except you come for a special deliverance. And I say, I don't see that in the whole Bible, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Everything is very clear. God said, if I see 10 over there, I'm going to spare them. And so many of the prayer warriors who say they are praying and then they go for prayer conferences and they go to prayer mountains and they go to prayer valleys and they go pray 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 everywhere and they and what are they praying about they are praying without understanding they are praying without knowing the principles that god works with thank god i'm delivered from the curse I said I'm delivered from the curse. Now, if you remember the New Testament, you know, Paul the Apostle was talking to uh, the Corinthians. He said, you that have unbelieving husband, you are a believer, your husband is an unbeliever. You that have unbelieving wives, you are a believer, your wife is a believer, you are, unbelie you are a believer, and then the other person, whether husband or wife, is an unbeliever. It says, do you understand? That the unbelieving husband is, tell me, sanctified, set apart because of the believing wife, because of that person in the family that is righteous. The righteousness will cover, will protect. It doesn't save them, but they are set apart if there's any curse, any affliction upon the family because you are the righteous person there. God will spare the rest of the family. And think about it, think about it, extend it a little bit. We have a local church. And that local church, we have about 100 members. And then we say that these 100 members, some of them are saved, some of them are not really truly saved. But if the pastor is righteous, if the leader is washed in the blood of the Lamb, and if the leaders there walking with that pastor, if they are righteous, here is Sodom, and here are ten people. God says, I'm going to spare that congregation because of these ten righteous people. That's what the Lord is teaching us here. It's not telling us that because there is just, a, you know, one person there that is not living there. Therefore, the rest of us were in trouble. Thank God I'm triumphant. Thank God I'm more than a conqueror. And because of my presence, my presence must bring light. My presence must bring security. My presence must bring the power of God. Look at the New Testament that God told there were 276 in the ship. And it was a great storm. They didn't know what they were going to do. They were casting all their wares into the river, into the sea. And then for 14 days, they had not eaten. And then an angel appeared to Paul, the apostle, and said, Paul, be of good cheer. Because 
of you only one paul inside that ship it says because of you the lord has given you all these people 276 that sail with you the trouble the perdition the destruction that should have been upon them because of you i spare everybody that's what we're learning here and the lord will give us understanding in jesus name and there were two people in the prison their names paul and silas and there were other prisoners there all those other prisoners they were unbelievers they were criminals they were you know terrible people that's why they were there in the prison and then we're told that paul and silas at midnight they sang praises unto god and they prayed and then the foundations of the prison what happened they shook and then it says the stocks and the bonds of paul and silas everything was loose how about the other prisoners there i said that about the bonds for the other people there they were loosed as well because of Paul and Silas. That's the principle here. So as you look at the scriptures entirely, you will understand that you're not going to say because, you know, in our family or our idol worshippers before in our family, this happened, that happened before. That means then uh, although I'm saved now, I'm still in trouble. Thank God I'm out of that trouble. I said I'm out of that trouble and because of your presence there all the people there and they don't understand they don't understand what they benefit because of your presence there the protection of the Lord will be upon them in Jesus name now we're going to look at uh, this uh, passage now from another perspective. All those perspectives I showed you now, that's for your personal benefit. Now we're looking at this passage now as ministers. We're looking at this passage as workers. We're looking at this passage as the people that are working for the Lord. And we're talking about intercession. We're talking about prayer. And then they tell us, you know the people who tell us about prayer, they say prayer is the key. Have you heard that before? Let's think about that prayer is the key. I'm talking to you tonight on the insufficiency of praying without preaching. The insufficiency of praying without preaching. Take those two things. Number one, prayer. Number two, preaching. There is praying without preaching. There is preaching without praying. There is preaching and praying. Number one, praying without preaching Sodom and you see that it was insufficient insufficient because even though Abraham prayed there were not enough righteous people there to spare Sodom because there were not 10 righteous people there Sodom was still destroyed how many righteous people can we even count there those who are righteous by any definition righteous by any description well we have lots because i said righteous with any description or definition we have lots we have uh, the two daughters and we even if we join the wife how many do you have there four not up to ten and what should we have done let there be praying let there be preaching let's come to another situation that is preaching without praying that come that reminds us of jonah he preached, he preached. He went through the city and then he prayed 40 days and then they shall be overthrown. He didn't pray for them. He didn't even he didn't say anything that would encourage them and intercede in any way. And as you think about an Nineveh, you're thinking about preaching without praying. And I say that's inconclusive. Praying without preaching is sufficient. Preaching without praying, inconclusive. And then number three, praying with preaching. Incredible, incredible. As you think about Jerusalem, you see all those apostles, what did they say? We will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. Not either or. Not that we will specialize in prayer. Uh -uh. We will specialize in preaching. Uh -uh. We'll give ourselves to prayer and then to the ministry of the word. It is preaching and praying. Praying and preaching. That's what brings incredible power upon the people. So there are three possibilities. Number one, praying without preaching. That doesn't achieve much. 
didn't do much in Sodom. And then preaching without praying, the people may receive benefit depending on how they take the preaching, but it didn't do much for Jonah. But the best, the ideal, and the one that is commanded by the Lord is praying and preaching. That uh, reminds us of Jerusalem, where they had incredible results. As I said, as I look at this passage, we're looking at the insufficiency of praying without preaching. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the exceeding sinfulness of Sodom. The exceeding sinfulness of Sodom. And we're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. Genesis chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. The men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly wicked exceedingly and because of that wickedness that's why god said he was going to destroy them and let's see how they perpetrated how they practiced and how they organized their crime their sin their evil their violence we're looking at genesis chapter 19 in genesis chapter 19 i'm looking at verse 4 in verse 4 it says before they lay down the men of the city even the men of sodom compassed the house round both old and young all the people from every quarter two visitors had come into the city two angels but they saw them as men and just because of the appearance of those true two visitors foreigners strangers all these people came from every quarter and they bombarded the place and they called unto lord in verse 5 and said unto him where are the men which came in uh, this night to thee this night bring them out unto us that we may know them uh, that word know them uh, is uh, how the husband knows the wife he's talking about having an immoral relationship with those men uh, those are sodomites because that's the major sin uh, one of the major sins of sodom they said where are the two men and think about these men that came young and old large number and all these people wanted to rape those two men bring them out we, we want to know them and look at this and lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and he said i pray you brethren do not so wickedly if it's just to know them for security or not say so don't do so wickedly it's talking about they were talking about wanting to know them in an immoral relationship it says behold now i have two daughters which have not known man let them let me i pray you bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes but only these men do nothing to them do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof and they said stand back and they said again this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge now where we deal worse with thee than with them and they pressed so upon the man even lord and came near to break the door and you can see how they were really intent on doing evil they wanted to do whatever they would do to behave like an animal was like an animal that was a scene of sodom look at verse 10 but the men put us the angels put their hands and he pulled lot into the house unto them and shut the door and smote the men that were at the door of the house with tell me blindness both small and great so that they wearied themselves to do what to find the door this uh, miracle of judgment came upon them they were blindfolded they couldn't see everything was dark even though they were blind they still were looking for the door and they wearied themselves to do evil you see watch that prayer of abraham had not changed them somebody did not go and preach repentance to them and nobody told them about the possibility of having a new lifestyle a different lifestyle praying is not enough without preaching and these people still continued oblivious ignorant of the fact that somebody had prayed for them brothers and sisters if we stay in our closest and we're praying and praying and praying for this city 
I was praying and praying for the sinners around us. I'm praying and praying for relatives who have not known the Lord. Prayer is not sufficient. Somebody must go out and tell them. That's why I thank the Lord that, you know, radio ministry is starting over here at the headquarters and it's been going on in some of the states. That's why I thank the Lord. Track distribution is going on. That's why I thank the Lord. Morning cry is going on. That's why I thank the Lord. Evangelism, so winning, is going on because the preaching must join the prayer. It is not just we're praying, we're Abraham prayed for Sodom, but look at the man and look at the way they were. Let's look at Micah and see the description of what happened there over there as they weary themselves to even find the door. After they were blindfolded, have you known people that were stricken with almost an incurable disease and yet the passion to sin and the eagerness to sin is still there even though they are suffering as a, as a result of the sin they have been committing, yet they will not uh, turn away from the scene. We're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the way they were. Micah chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 2. Micah chapter 7, verse 2. It says, the good man is perished out of the earth. As you look at Sodom, no good man there, no righteous man there, no sick person there, except those four we spoke about. And there is none upright among them. They all lie in wait for blood, and they hunt every man his brother with a net. Look at this in verse 3, and it says that they may do evil, how? With both hands earnestly. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly. That is, it was like their full-time job. It was the thing they were passionate about, eager about, earnest about, committed to. They'll do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince seeketh and the judge asketh for a reward and the great man he uttered his mischievous desire so they wrap each up the best of them is a briar the the most upright is sharper than a sunny edge the day of their watchman of their watchman and the visitation cometh now shall it be their perplexity and so you find uh, the situation of sodom now we've spoken about sodom that was a real place that you know there was um, and there was a uh, prayer for them intercession for them but because the intercession was not backed up by evangelism and so winning and preaching and saturation evangelism in-depth evangelism the prey did not do much let's now come to isaiah chapter one isaiah chapter one and god is talking about uh, you know some kind of people and the people he's talking about there you'll be surprised who they were we're looking at um, isaiah chapter one in isaiah chapter one i'm reading here from verse uh, from verse um, 4. I start with one verse 4. It says in verse 4, a ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil 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 doers children that are corruptors they are forsaking the lord they knew the lord before they are forsaking the lord he's talking about israel they have provoked the holy one of israel unto anger they are gone away backward what the lord say about them look at verse 10 here hear the word of the lord ye rulers of tell me sodom Israel became so bad, Israel became so evil that God looked at them. They were like Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what a purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Says the Lord, I am full of burnt offerings of ram and the fat of a fed beast and i delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs and of he goats when ye come to appear before me who has required this at your hand to tread my cause this were religious people their lives have become so bad so terrible so defiled and so darkened they were compared or sodom and yet there are people that think that the only thing we let's keep on pray let's keep on praying you know what prayer what prayer no we must teach them and preach sound doctrine and preach repentance and call them out of sin and come to the lord 
pray alone for Sodom will not work, will not bring salvation, will not avert the judgment of God, and pray alone for the denominations of religious people in our day, in our land, will not do the work. We pray, yes, very important. We intercede, very important. But we also preach. We preach the word and bring the people to conviction because that is what will turn the tide. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And let's see the verdict and uh, what the Lord is saying about not only the people of Jerusalem, about the, even the prophets and the preachers and the pastors in Jerusalem. In Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 14. I have seen also the prophets of, tell me, Jerusalem. I'm asking like that so I know whether you have opened your Bible or not. That's uh, one method of knowing whether you are just uh, looking at me and uh, or looking at your Bible. Are you there? Yes. Give me a good answer. I know you are there. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of, Je of uh, Jerusalem an horrible sin. They commit adultery and walk in lies and strengthen also the hands of evil doers that none do, that none does return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as tell me Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as tell me Gomorrah. You look at uh, the many churches we have in our land. As the churches multiply, corruption multiplies in this country. As the prayer houses multiply, defilement, evil, drunkenness, uh, immorality increases in this country. And in this continent, maybe and all over the world, as the fellowships and the assemblies are increasing, and all this one says, I'm called, and he has a card, he's a apostle, the other one is a prophet, the other one is evangelist, the other one is a great a pastor, the other one is the international teacher of the word of God, and there's something going on there, going on, going on there. We can see the result. All the preachers, all the prophets, all the people that are proclaiming, well, well, you know, people say, Nigeria is a religious country. Anywhere you go, any part of the world, you're going to find some Nigerians. Say, what have you come to do here? We're doing missionary work. What's the effect of it? Because God said, all these people, they are like unto me, Sodom, like unto me, Gomorrah. And then there are people that are saying, yes, we know the condition of the church. We know the condition of the ministries. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh-uh. Prayer alone will not do it. Let somebody rise up and tell the truth. Let somebody rise up and show the people that God looks at all these religious people as Sodom and Gomorrah and there must be preaching that will go along with the prayer. Look at verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with warm wood and make them drink the water of God. God, for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Uh, from the sometimes when you read in the papers, the things that these so called preachers are doing, and from there you have the source of defilement and immorality going out and flowing out from all those churches. Ezekiel has something to tell us, we must read. Ezekiel chapter 16, I'm reading here from verse 4. 49. Ezekiel chapter 15, chapter 16, and we're looking at uh, verse uh, 49. Look at this. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. It's talking to the children of Israel, and it's now saying that Sodom is their sister. He said, you're related. You're the same. Although you're religious, although you're offering sacrifices, although you're burning all this, all this incense, but all the same, Sodom is your sister. It says that this was the iniquity of the sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread. And idleness and, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hands of the poor and the needy. Yeah, look up here for a moment. Uh, you know, there are churches that major on prosperity, riches, and wealth. And uh, in those uh, churches, the uh, pastors are living fat 
they're getting big and you know they have a big uh, bank accounts and the poor people they, they, they blindfold them and tell them give it shall be given unto you give 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 and those people are giving all the time and the poor people are still there and the poor people they've been there for years and they are hoping that if i give more if i give more and if i give more some of them will die in poverty and penury somebody should tell them that we need to balance up the word of God and we shouldn't go into that uh, kind of concept over here and feel that you know this is what you do because it says they have not strengthened the poor and they need it look at verse 50 and they were haughty and committed abomination before me therefore I took them away as I saw good look at uh, verse 51 neither and Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thy abomination more than they, and have justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. It says, Thou also, which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they that's the children those are the children of israel they became even more abominable than sodom and gomorrah and what did jesus say when jesus came over here and he ministered to those uh, people look at matthew chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 we're reading from verse 23 matthew chapter 11 verse 23 these people and it says and thou capernaum which art exalted unto heaven because of their privileges shall be brought down to hell for if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom it would have remained until this day but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee the children of Israel were so terrible at the time of Jesus Christ that Jesus Jesus said, you're more guilty than the Sodomites because of the evil that you do. And now as we come to Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, I want you to read this and have understanding of the condition of the people so that we will see the land in which we're living and we see how God looks at this land in comparison with Sodom and Gomorrah. And if we're going to be of any help to the land in which we live, we must say, well, pray. Yes, we need to pray. We intercede. We need to intercede but we intercede we instruct we pray and we preach we're looking at revelation chapter 11 i'm looking at verse 8 revelation 11 verse 8 and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called tell me sodom and egypt where also our lord was crucified where was our lord crucified where was our Lord crucified? Jerusalem. And he's saying that Jerusalem is as evil as Sodom. As Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, if that is the case, as we think about Sodom, many years gone by, centuries gone by, millennia gone by, we now think about our own place, our own cities, our own nation, and understand that God says judgment is coming. In fact, Jesus said, as it was in the time of Sodom of uh, Noah, uh, so shall it be at the time when the man of God shall come. And as it was in the time of Lord, when he came out of Sodom, so shall it be at the son of uh, the son of man when he shall come. Which means the world will be as bad as Sodom. And if there's anything we need to do today, we need to carry evangelism higher. We need to take our preaching further. And we need to be passionate and a very aggressive in our preaching don't just stay somewhere at a pray, prayer mountain stay somewhere in a you know closet and we're praying we're praying we're praying no we must go beyond and then we must reach out to the people and as we reach out to the people i pray the lord will answer our prayers and also make use of our preaching to reach out to the people in jesus name i come to point number two the exceptional uh, the exceptional supplication for sodom exceptional supplication for Sodom. 
Uh, let, let's, let's look at this in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, uh, and we're looking at uh, verse 23. Genesis chapter 18, uh, and we're reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23, And Abram drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous ways, the wicked? And then already we've read the passage. He was uh, praying for Sodom. And he was saying, what if you find 50 people there, will you not spare them? 40 righteous people, won't you spare them? 30 righteous people, won't you spare them? 20, 10 righteous people, will you not spare them? And God said, if I find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the whole of the people for the sake of the 10. But was he able to find 10 people? No, no. But, you know, we, we understand the limitations at that time. But you know that uh, Abraham had how many servants? 314. 314. And these uh, servants, they knew the God of Abraham. And these servants, one of them is the person he sent out to go and look for a wife for Isaac. And you see how that servant, you see how he prayed. And you see how he connected with the almighty God. And as soon as he finished the prayer, you see the result. And then he got to them, he knew communication. He knew distribution. He knew organization. He knew, he knew everything. That servant... The other servants do the same thing. Do you remember in chapter 14 when uh, the you know, people came in confederacy and then they took uh, the people of Sodom away and Lot and the wives and their goods? Abraham organized 314 uh, of his servants and they went out and they defeated the people. Abraham knew how to defeat those enemies. And these uh, 314 uh, people, they knew the God of Abraham. But Abraham did not think of organizing them to go to, a Gomorrah, to Sodom and Gomorrah and go and talk about the God of Abraham. Go and tell them. He just prayed for them. And we have so many workers, more than 314, that can reach out and give trust, reach out and talk to people, reach out and tell them judgment is coming upon this world. If we do like Abraham and we only pray and pray and pray, Sodom will still Till be destroyed. Therefore, we want to get all our members, we want to get all our people and organize them and train them and teach them and tell them, yes, we will pray, but we're going to preach. What did Jesus tell us? Go into all the world and tell me and preach the gospel to every creature. He prayed, but the prayer was not sufficient. Exceptional supplication for Sodom. We're coming to look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. I'm reading here from verse 9. Exodus chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, And, and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. And tell me the rest. I will make of thee a great nation. Please notice that. Notice that. What God said is, I'll wipe the people. I'll kill all of them. All of them. Everyone. Men, women, old, young, everyone. And then I'll start all over with you. And then with you, I'll make a great nation. We must understand the terms that God was using. And then let's go on now. In verse, um, in verse uh, 11, it says, And Moses besought the Lord, his God has prayer, and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with uh, a mighty? And then he continued the prayer and told him in verse 13 remember Abraham Isaac and Israel thy servants and then he goes on to say and, and the Lord in verse 14 and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people hold on what does that mean 
The Lord repented of the evil. He changed his mind. He turned his mind on what he want to do, what he wanted to do unto the people. What's that? That he would have destroyed the old and the young, the men and the women, the suckling and the child, everybody, and then he will raise up from Moses another nation. That's what it means. He wasn't going to do that anymore. But the people that uh, made the idol, the people that bowed down to the idol, and the people that said, O Israel, these be thy gods that brought you out of the land. Does that mean they were not punished? And they didn't die? And you know the history of the children of Israel. You understand? It doesn't mean that because Moses had preached, if he didn't preach to the people, if he didn't tell the people about repentance, doesn't mean that they have been spared. Look at it yourself. We're looking at it now from Exodus chapter Exodus chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 26. Look at what followed. And then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. You see, he had to preach to them. He had to call them to this. You have to call them to repentance. It's not just the prayer. Moses prayed. Yes, he prayed. Moses interceded. Yes, he interceded. But he called the people and he made an open call. A universal call. Whosoever, anyone, anyone can come. Who is on the Lord's side? Only the Levites came and he said, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, put every man on his sword by his side and go in and out of the gate and throw out the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his uh, companion and every man his neighbor and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and their fell of the people that day about how many? 3,000 men. Did he pray for those 3,000 men to yes? He prayed for the whole nation, but this one did not repent. This one was still that amount in their rebellion. You see, pray alone will not save the people. Pray alone will not secure the people. Pray alone will not keep the people. Let's look at this now. I'm reading from verse 31. And, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have seen the great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he didn't finish the sentence, and if not, blot me, I pray thee out of the book which thou hast written. Verse 33. Everybody wants to go read. You see, whosoever sin against me, he will I blot out of my book. Those were the people Moses prayed for. And God said, I wipe out the whole nation. What God changed in answer to that prayer is that I will not wipe out the whole nation, men and women and youth and children, and then start all over with you. As for the personal responsibility of the sinner, the sinner still has to repent, the sinner still has to come out of that idolatry, out of that evil, to become saved. The intercession of Moses by itself without the preaching and calling them to repentance saves nobody that's why god said whosoever have sinned against me in the same chapter it's still the same chapter whosoever has sinned against me he will i blot out of my book which has written look at verse 35 and the lord tell me plague the people because they made the calf which aaron made he plagued them many of them still died because intercession alone, prayer alone, does not score the point. We preach as well as pray. We pray as well as preach. We're looking at Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And in Numbers chapter 14, I'm reading from verses 19 and 20. Numbers chapter 14, verse, uh, verse 19. Chapter 14, verse 19. Are we there? very important. We need to understand the scriptures. Otherwise, we'll be basing our hope on something false, on something partial, on something that is not totally truthful. Now we're asking the question, from this passage, 
Numbers chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. What can we learn about intercession? Well, not just from those two verses, more read beyond the two verses. Look at verse 19. Pardon, I, I, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast uh, forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Verse 20. And the Lord said, tell me, I have pardoned according to thy word now. We as uh, Deeper Life Bible Church, we must read beyond those two verses. You see, if you read those two verses, and Moses prayed, and God said, okay, you tell me to pardon them, I have pardoned them. What's the understanding of I have pardoned them? He said, these people are rebellious. Moses, let my anger wax hot against them. I'll blot them out, everyone. And Moses said, God, don't do that. Pardon them. And God said, I have pardoned them in the sense that I will not blot them out as a whole nation. Now, read the very next verse. Look at the next verse. verse what's the next verse? Read that out. Okay, verse 22 now. Look at verse 23. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them pro that provoke me see it. You see, if you limit yourself to verses 19 and 20, you're going to get a wrong answer. And you are going to get a erroneous view. And you are going to make a wrong conclusion about prayer. You are going to say, pray, pray, pray. Once you pray, finish. No, you read the next verses that tell us what God said immediately. I have pardoned them in the sense that I will not blot out the nation. I will still allow them to remain as a nation. But uh, let's go on now. I'm reading from verse 23. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear on to their fathers neither shall any of them that provoked me see it and then he gave the privilege to uh, Caleb and then the privilege he gave to uh, Joshua verse 26 and the Lord say and the Lord speak unto Moses and unto Aaron bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me i have heard the murmurings of the children of israel which they murmur against me say unto them as truly as i live says the lord as ye have spoken in mine ears so will i do due to you your carcasses will fall in this wilderness and all that all that uh, num were numbered of you according to the whole number from 20 years old upward which have murmured against me uh, what the lord said was that he wanted to destroy all of them five years, ten years, fifteen years, seventeen years, everybody, from the, from the smallest to the oldest. But now he said, okay, I will not wipe out the whole nation, so that I don't start a new nation from you, Moses, but all the people that have sinned are not repented. They're still going to be wiped out, and they will spend forty years and be wasted in forty years in the wilderness from twenty years upwards. This is the reason why, as you read the Bible and study the Bible, the ministry of preaching and the ministry of evangelism is very, very important. That prayer, prayer alone does not evangelize the world. Prayer alone does not lead people to know the Lord. And you see what he said uh, over there that he was going to destroy them from among uh, the people. And let us go now to verse, uh, I'm reading from verse uh, 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we are, will be here and we will go up unto the place which the Lord has promised uh, for we have sinned. Now they confess, but the confession was too late. Look at verse 41 and Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not uh, prosper. Go not up. 
for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye have turned away from the Lord, therefore the Lord will not be what you bought, they presume to go up unto the hilltop. Uh, nevertheless the ark of the covenant of the lord and moses departed not out of the camp and the amalekites came down and the canaanites which dwelt in the hill and uh, smote them and discomfited them even unto homer and so you see uh, that's why it's uh, very important for us i will pray with the understanding and then I will study to show myself approved unto God as workman that not needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Very important that we divide the word of truth appropriately. Moses prayed, but you've seen the result. The people must repent. Abraham prayed for Sodom, but you know Sodom was still destroyed. Somebody said prayer is a key. Some people think prayer is the key. But is that the key? The answer is no. What are we to do? Pray and preach. Preach and pray. Call religious people to righteousness. Call the church to separation and holiness and sanctification. Intercessors and prayer warriors are praying, yet sinners and backsliders are multiplying and perishing in our land. Only those who turn many to righteousness will be rewarded on the final day. We're looking at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You'll be among them. Amen. Turning people to righteousness in Jesus' name. Uh, let us come back now. Point number three, the eternal suffering of Sodom. The eternal suffering of Sodom. Can we pray for people and they still perish? Yes. And you see, even though we say that we're deeper life, a Bible church, our prayer now has been limited. Our prayer is limited to let people get healed, let people get delivered, let people have jobs. Let people have some conveniences and luxuries. Let people have their problems solved. Our people are suffering. Our people are suffering. Let's pray so that all this suffering will be over. Our prayer has become so limited. We're not praying for their souls. We're not praying for their salvation. We're not praying for their relationship with God. We're not praying that should the Lord come at this time now, that our people be rapturable. We're not praying for their righteousness and holiness and sanctification. All we're praying for is that remove all these problems. Pastor, uh, there are a lot of our people, they're married, they don't have any children. Let's have a prayer conference and let's, you know, get all these problems solved. There are a lot of of our people, they are into marriageable age and they have not married and if uh, you know we can devote time apart and pray for them and all these problems will shake everything away. There are people that are under oppression, under attack. If we can just have a prayer conference, whatever, and then we pray and we shake all these things away so that the people will know that our God is still alive. We can do all that and backsliders will still remain backsliding. We can do all that and sinners will still remain in their sins. We need to pray so that our people will escape the judgment that is coming upon the world. Look at all the people that received the prayer. I come to the New Testament and see the people that Jesus healed. He healed them to the point that we were told everyone that touched him, they were healed. He healed them to the point that they all gathered. And one time he fed 5,000 people. Another time he fed 4,000 people. Another time just multitudes. And then he sent out all the disciples and, you know, they, they preached repentance. And then he says many of them were healed. Then he sent out the 70. And then the 70 returned. They said, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. And he said, yes, I saw 
shall Satan fall as lightning. And behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Healings and miracles everywhere. But when he came to arrest Jesus Christ, and then Pilate said, What has he done? Okay. Who will I give unto you? Barabbas or Jesus? And all the people shouted, give us Barabbas. What will I do with your king? What will I do with you? They said, crucify him. And the people said, let his blood be upon us. I thought the people had received healing. And they received deliverance. And then, uh, you know, when he rose from the dead, about 500 people saw him. 500. 500 saw him after the resurrection. Where have they gone? The 4,000 that were fed miraculously. Where have they gone? The 5,000, where are they? And the multitudes that were healed, just touching them like this, touching them like this. Touch, he raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. He opened blind eyes and the limb rose up and they walked. Great, great miracles that all over the sea he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And when he rose up from the dead, only about 500 saw him. Think about that. How many of those people got to heaven? Think about that. And then he said, You wait in Jerusalem until ye be and were power from on high. And on the day of Pentecost, how many people were there? Tell me out loud. Why the other people? 380 out of 500. Why even saying that 500 is small out of the many people that receive prayer and miracle? How about, you know, out of the 500, where are they? They, they were not interested in you shall receive power. After that, really ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. Uh -uh. They were not interested in that. All they were interested in, you have seen miracles because you have eaten bread and your belly is full. That's why you're seeking for me. Seek not the Lord for the things that perish, but seek for everlasting life, eternal life. That's what the Lord is telling us. As we look at this story, don't uh, you know, branch off and go off on a tangent. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Preaching, soul winning, evangelism, conviction of sin. Because all these people, they still perished. We will not perish. Our people will not perish. Let's look at Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. I'm reading here from verse 12. Genesis chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 12. Genesis chapter 19 verse 12. Here is what he's telling us here in verse 12. And the men, the angel, said unto the Lord, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and, uh, and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent as sent us to destroy it and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law that married his daughters and said up oh, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city but it seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law he didn't believe him he didn't accept what he said Lord You've never spoken about the Lord. You've never preached to us. You've never warned us. You, you know the life we live. We, we, we're proposing to marry your daughters. And you didn't even talk about our lives. Now you're coming from somewhere. And you're telling us, oh, the Lord is about to destroy this place. You must be joking. Are you drunk? Something must have happened to you. Where did you get that? That's what they thought. It was too late. You know, the people we, you know, rub shoulders with, we talk to them, we're friendly with them, we see them. We never talk about the Lord. All of a sudden, we come up, we wake up now, and we're talking to my brother, you know, something is going to happen. Because something is going to happen. And uncle, something is going to happen. And you say, please, please, if you are drunk, go get, get, get off your drunkenness. Don't tell me that. We, we've always been uh, good, uh, you know, good fellows together. And uh, you never spoke about this. You are speaking about this. They won't take you serious. 
But if you go back to pray, pray for yourself first that God will forgive you with all the relationship you have people you are not talking to them and now you are just waking up and you're telling them that this is going to happen they've never seen you to be a believer it's we that know that you're a worker it's we in our church that's a leader that's a pastor that's a preacher your people don't know you that you're a preacher and that you have fire in your bones and you have fire in your system and that there's something burning within you want to tell them and you're saying that this is the urgent thing this is the most important thing the world is going to be destroyed and you must come out of this destruction and look at verse 15 here in verse 15 and it went the morning arose then the angels eastern lord saying arise take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here the others were not there lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city and while he lingered you see that he knew that destruction was coming yet he lingered you know the kind of people that say no judgment is coming judgment is coming and yet they are still burying their souls in the world the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters the lord be merciful unto him and he brought him forth and set him without the city and it came to pass when they when they had when they had brought them forth abroad that he said escape for thy life look not behind thee neither stay thou in all the plain escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed verse 26 but tell me read very well one two three go now uh, what kind of faith did that wife have what kind of understanding did she have that when an angel speaks, 100% that thing will be fulfilled? What kind of understanding did that wife have that these angels, she was in the house when the men of Sodom came and they just did their hands like that and all those men and boys everyone became blind she was there she she should have understood that what these angels said they meant it but she was still lingering look not behind you and then they came out an angel held a hand an angel spoke to her an angel looked into her face look not behind thee there is danger and it's not just temporary danger there's going to be eternal perdition and damnation and doom and danger look not behind thee and then as they were going think about that that she didn't fully and wholeheartedly believe everything that the angels had said and she looked back can it be true that fire will burn Sodom and Gomorrah? Can it be true? All our hearts, men, what separated us from Abraham? What are we fighting about? What did we strive for? Can it be true? All our hearts, men, they are there. Nobody is coming out. Can it be true? All our cattle, can it be true? All our property, can it be true? Everything we amass, is he going to burn like that? Can I trust these angels? Are we going out for nothing? Am I going to lose everything? The work of our hands and all that thing that we controlled? Is fire really burning there? And she looked back and she became a pillar of salt. You will think everybody that hurt will take everything to heart, but not so. And now she perished. And Jesus said, remember Lord's wife the end is about to come you will not say we have only been praying and praying and praying you know we have not only been interested we have been preaching to you we have been giving you the word do you believe everything that you have heard are you staking your life on everything that you have heard or are you saying well I've heard everything they've said but they said don't look back because he that's a friend of the world is the enemy of God <laughs> am I going to take all that on board completely you better do because this is the time final judgment is coming 
And fire came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. We're looking at Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 7. Jude chapter 1 verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There's hellfire. That's judgment. And we don't know when the time will be, but it's sooner than later. And the Lord will be getting prepared, saying, Children, the time is up. Come on home. And the people who are ready will go with the Lord. But those who are like the relatives and the in-laws of Lord that will not accept the word, they know that we're deep alive. They know that we preach the word. They don't even volunteer any time. My brother, I really appreciate you. The way you take care of me and what you do for me. I'll follow you to your church one day. Our relatives don't. Our cousins don't. Our nephews don't. The people who are related with us, they, don't, they benefit from us. We we'll give them this, give them this, and give them that. There's no day, day, even without our calling them. And when we call them, uh -uh. My sister, my brother, you know I, I'm not a pagan. I have my own church too. What's the evidence of that church on them? And you, you are satisfied. You say, they have their own church too. But the fire is coming. And it's going to be eternal fire. And all these are people that were not bold enough to tell them that judgment is coming. Where will you be? Where will you spend eternity? Even our own members, our own members, we have authority over them. And we see them the way they live and the things they do. Even our own workers, the things they do. And we do not have the concern to say, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And we leave them like that. What kind of workers are we? What kind of Lord are we? And what kind of a Lord's wife are we? What kind of Lord's daughters are we? Is this the way we're going to practice religion at the end of time? Or are we going to wake up and say, what the word of God says is true. Judgment is coming. All will be there. Those who have rejected, those who have spawned the message, we're going to rise up and rescue the perishing and plead with them earnestly and bring them into the kingdom. There's a great day coming, a great day coming when God shall plant the sinners and the sinners shall be on the left and then he'll take the saints away. Where will you be on that day? And where will your members be? Where will your relatives be? Where will the people, the people of this city, where will they be? I won't be preaching and praying for healing and all that. I about their souls. Where will they spend eternity? Well, from this time, we'll take this word serious. I said we'll take this word serious. And whether they will run away from us or not, we're going to tell them so that we'll not be guilty on the final day. You never told me. I will not be guilty. I've told you. You will not be guilty if you go and tell them. Will you tell them? Let's rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We need to go out and tell them. Go out and reach them. It's not just prayer, 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 prayer. It is preaching. It's evangelism. It's preaching the word. And put that word on fire. Let it burn in their soul. Let it burn from your own heart. And reach out to them. And pierce them. And convict them. And bring them away from their sin. And bring them to the same the insufficiency of praying without preaching we must preach 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 the word preach the word be instant in season out of season rebuke reprove exhort with long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but they'll heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears they'll turn away from the truth and then they turn to religion and turn to error but 
you get up and preach the word and bring sinners on their knees under conviction and lead them to the Lord until they're really, really, really born again, getting ready for heaven. <laughs>